We're grateful for all of you that are here tonight and greet you in the name of the Lord together with those that are on live stream. This will be our 50th lesson exposition of the book of Amos. We're commencing the ninth chapter tonight, the first verse. The one thing we've beheld, particularly in our study in uh, Genesis, in the accounts of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the sobriety with which those patriarchs handled the promises of God. And it's, it's very, uh, very consistent. None of the patriarchs were sloppy. I mean, this has been very unusual throughout the history of the world, understand. None of them were sloppy in handling the promises of God. None of them forgot them. Mm -hmm. None of them failed to shape their lives by them. And I want to say a few words about this. Commencing with Abraham, <clears throat> which was over 2,000 years after the world was, after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, there were new, a new kind of promise was it given by God that hadn't been given before. Promises that related to the future, which, which hadn't been, promises of this gender had not been given before. I'll briefly recap some of them. I will make thee a great nation. I will make thy name great. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And they shall all nations, all families of the earth be blessed. I will give Canaan to thee, thou shalt be a blessing. Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. Thou shalt be a father of many nations. I will give thee and all thy seed, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Sarah thy wife shall bear a son indeed. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. I will give unto thy seed all of these countries. Thy seed shall be as a dust of the earth and shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north. I will not leave thee until I have done all that I have spoken to thee of. I will surely do thee good. That's some of them. See, there were not promises like that before Abraham. We reaffirm it. There were not promises like that before Abraham. <clears throat> These were unprecedented. Yeah. Took that long before God could speak like this <laughs> to the human race. That's what sin did to the human race. Yeah, right. Took a long time before they could get to kindergarten. Took a long time. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob received these promises. Nobody else did. Right. Amen. They became custodians of them. Mm -hmm. No one would learn of these things unless they told them. Mm -hmm. These were not repeated to anybody after Jacob. Mm -hmm. That's right. So if they didn't announce these, mm -hmm. they would just fall to the ground. Mm -hmm. Now we are in the book of Amos. Centuries have passed, and we find out these men were faithful to pass these along. Now, this nation we're living in now is just a few hundred years old. And the things that were known when this nation began have nearly been obliterated by this time. I'm showing how unusual this is. Yes, uh -huh. Somebody, somebody wasn't faithful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Somebody dropped the ball. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Somebody got consumed with other things and didn't pass these things along. Yeah. I'm not sure when it all began. This I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But it did begin. Mm -hmm. And so now we've got a generation that are totally separate from their fathers. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. 
Not the same kind of people at all. Well, this ought to give us a deep appreciation for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They made sure their generations after them were not raised in ignorance. Now, it's this circumstance that makes Israel's sin so grievous. The fact that the fathers did pass it wasn't that they didn't know. This was passed on to them. They'd been swaddled in the promises of God from day one. Promises that had the likes of which had never been known before. And that's nothing to compare with what promises have been given to those in Christ. That's not. <laughs> I'm sorry, we can't excuse the fact yes. that people don't know this, these things in our country. This is inexcusable. Amen. It cannot be looked over. It's not enough to say, well, they just didn't know, they just didn't work. To that's not enough. Yes. If God indicted Israel for not knowing, we ought not to need to comment yeah. about what he thinks about this country we're living in and about the churches that are in it. There are people in the churches that, are, that know less of the promises of God than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody has been and continues to be unfaithful. Further, Israel had seen some of these promises materialize. They see the nation develop. They see barren women give children. They saw the land possessed. They saw the enemies routed. They saw deliverance from Egypt. See, they, been, they saw confirmation. So the testimony later should have been stronger than the testimony Amen. before. See, the nature of God's kingdom to increase, not decrease. Yeah, yeah. This God's kingdom doesn't decrease. Amen. It increases. And where it isn't increasing, it's not the kingdom. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Now Amos is chronicling the Lord's response to the dullness of Israel, their disobedience, their self-centeredness. And his prophecy bears relevance to our generation because the sins of this generation is far worse than the sins of that one. Yes. Because there's greater light, see, there's Amen. greater light. Yeah. More has been made known. We're going to deal with the first verse of chapter 9. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them. And I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Amen. <laughs> How would you like to have a message like that to deliver? So you've got a gospel to preach. How would you like to have that message to preach? Huh? The scene now shifts to another vision. Amos has seen the vision of the devouring grasshoppers. In the seventh chapter, he's been shown that God contended with fire. Seventh chapter, verse 4. He saw the Lord stand on a wall with a plumb line in his hand, ready to measure Israel. He saw a basket of summer fruit. And now he sees the Lord stand on the walls. This is the fifth fifth vision that Amos has had. All of these were various likenesses of divine judgment and destruction. None of, none of them were things for good. Now, you remember the time of Pharaoh, he had received two dreams about the same thing. And Joseph told him, you received two dreams because the thing is certain. Now, if two presentations made the thing certain, what does five do? This is not a possibility we're reading about. This is not just a threat. This is an announcement of something that's going to happen. I, 
the personal testimony. If you don't believe Amos, there's, you got no other proof than just his word on this. I saw the Lord. The other verses read, I saw the sovereign one. I saw a vision of God. I saw my Lord. I've seen the Lord. Most versions read, I simply, simply read, I saw the Lord. Now other men, few in number, have experienced something similar. Jacob saw the Lord standing above a ladder that reached from earth to heaven. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, quote, saw the God of Israel. Exodus 24, 9. The nobles of the children of Israel saw God. Exodus 24, 11. Micaiah the prophet said, I saw the Lord. 1 Kings 22, 19. Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord. Isaiah 6, 1. Ezekiel saw visions of God. Ezekiel 1, 1. Daniel saw the Ancient of Days sitting on a throne. Daniel 7, 9. And John saw a throne in heaven and the one sitting upon it. Revelation 4, 2 and 3. So you see, periodically something like this has happened. Not, not, not very often. But it has happened. These visions, of course, were not a full exposure to God. They didn't see God in his fullness. And it's important to know that. For God said, no man, no man can see me and live. That's God's statement. Exodus 33, 20. John said, no man has seen God at any time. John 1.18, and in the first epistle, he repeats the same thing again in 1 John 4.12. No man has seen God at any time. So what the people saw was an accommodation to human frailty. They saw the glory or they saw some evidence of God. They didn't see God himself in all of his fullness. They couldn't, they couldn't have endured it. <clears throat> to see the glory of God is to see some aspect of the divine nature. Jacob saw God as the one who was governing the affairs of the earth, standing on this ladder with angels going, coming, see, yeah. governing the affairs of the earth. He saw that aspect. Moses and those with him saw God in a transparent f pavement indicating that God ruled in an unquestionable and evident manner mm -hmm. with no ambiguity. Yeah. The nobles of Israel saw God and ate in his presence. Mm -hmm. says they ate in his presence, mm -hmm. confirming that man could be mm -hmm. in the presence of God and stay alive uh -huh. Uh -huh. and even be nourished. Yeah. Micaiah saw the Lord on the throne making determinations that would occur on the earth. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, being holy and pure in all of his ways. Ezekiel had visions of a working God, ministering judgment, and ensuring the name that his name would be known in the earth, sitting on a throne that was mobile. Mm -hmm. Went here and... See, all of these were aspects of yeah, God's right. nature that were seen. Well, this establishes to us that God does want to be known. Because no one asked for these. Uh -huh. In fact, nobody knew that you could have such a thing as this. God wants to be known. He would not. He would not accommodate himself to human weaknesses if this was not the case. You like he put a veil on before he before he appeared before men. God be praised that he's that kind of God. And even then, even with him, when he was veiled, uh -huh. his presence was there, arresting and yeah. frightening the people. And some people thought they were going to die. I saw the Lord, Amos said. I saw the Lord. Okay, yes. Yeah, you know, we have the benefit. Of course, we're in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. But we have the benefit of seeing all of these visions at once. Yeah. And, 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 and to understand somewhat more of 
of what who, what and who God is, and yet we are nowhere touched the hem of the garment as far as no, yeah. no. no. <laughs> well, he said, I saw the Lord standing on the altar. In other words, and say, by the altar. New American Standard says, beside the altar. The other Bible says, at the altar. But the majority of the versions say, on or upon the altar. Now I'm going to proceed assuming he was standing on the altar. For the same reason the mercy seat was on the Ark of the Covenant. He was identifying himself with the altar. Some think that this is the altar's altar that was at Bethel to the idol. I can't imagine God standing on the altar that was made to. That's just foolish. Amen. Yeah. That's not worthy of any further thought. Yeah. Here the Lord's identified with the altar he'd ordained, mm. yeah. and that Israel had polluted, they'd profaned it by bringing unacceptable offerings, even down to the lame and the sick, and by substituting altars built for idols in his place. I saw him standing on this, shall we say, neglected altar. Yeah. Yeah. Men hadn't thought to honor this altar. They had, by the dictates of their king, built altars in another place to make worship more convenient, make sacrifice more convenient. But when God makes himself known, it's not in connection with the altars men concocted. Amen. Yeah. He's standing on his altar, Amen. taking people back to that. Now there's a point to be seen here in this. <laughs> God will not identify himself with anything that is false. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Amen. Uh, he will not. Particularly when it relates to religion. Particularly, he will not tie himself to that. He will not give his glory to that. Yes. Amen. He will not give his power mm -hmm. to that. All right, let's... Uh, <laughs> His sanctifying presence will not be associated with such things. This ought to be apparent, but we must enlarge upon it. The less reason upon it. God will not yeah. identify himself with what is false. Yes, amen. He will not give his power yes. to what is false. Amen. He will not sanctify what is false. Yes. He will not confer a blessing through what is false. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right? God will not save a person through a false gospel. Amen. Right. Repeat this prayer after me hmm. is an exercise yeah. in vanity. God will not work through that. No matter how many people said he did. Mm -hmm. It's like honoring the altars made to the golden calf. That's right. He will not work for good, for the good of an individual, mm -hmm. through an erroneous message. Amen. He will not. Now I know some of the recovery systems say, I was close to God because of this. Either they just outright lied or they're ignorant. And I think they say that because that's what the manual says to say. Anything or anyone God sanctifies must first be cleansed of all defilement and set apart for him. Before Christ moves in, sin's got to move out. Amen. Yeah. That's the way it is. Yeah, right. You may come to God defiled, we understand that, but you, before, before, the, before he moves in, the defilement has got to be washed away. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 
Spiritual advancement cannot be achieved by carnal means. So if a person wants to grow in grace and truth like, he's, like it, God has designed, it, it cannot be accomplished through some man-made means any more than the blessing of God could come to the altar to the golden calf. Amen, that's right. Illumination cannot come through humanly devised means. You can't know more about grace by studying a method that man cooked up. Yeah, that's right. I know that they say they can, but they're not telling the truth. Amen. That's like honoring the mm -hmm. idol made, the altar made to a golden calf. Illumination can't come by humanly devised means. The eyes of your understanding can't be opened by something that had its genesis with man. Mm -hmm. Amen. This is impossible. Yeah. See, this is all prefigured in this. That's right. What we're reading about here. They had to give up the God of this altar. The one he was That's standing. Right. They had to give that up That's to right. go to these other altars. Yes. Yeah. For the believer, everything associated with divine blessing and benefit mm. centers in and is facilitated by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God really doesn't have anything to give of eternal consequence mm -hmm. that doesn't come through Christ. Yeah. You may get rain and sunlight, but that, that's going to pass when the heavens and the earth pass. They have something to have anything, anything that transports to glory. you got to get it through Jesus Christ. Amen. And you can only get it through Jesus Christ if, you were, if you're born again and have faith. Uh -huh. yes. That's the way it works. The Lord Jesus Christ is like the sanctifying altar through which everything is received. And when God is found, he'll always be standing on the altar. Amen. Now, our altar is the cross. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, that's, that's our altar. And you want to find Jesus, God, that, that, that's where you find him. All right, now God speaks. Of course, every time you see God, he says something. God never appears just to be seen. Yeah. He'll say something. If he comes down on Sinai, he'll say something. If he appears at the top of a ladder of Jacob, he says something. Mm -hmm. If he appears to Abraham, he says something. Mm -hmm. appears to Isaac, Jacob, he says something. Yeah. God always says something when he appears. There's no reason for God to appear if he's not going to speak. He's not just trying to impress people. He's trying to raise, raise people up and acquaint them with himself. So God speaks. The words now are remarkably strong that he says. Some people would think that they, they, I don't think God could say something that strong, but he did. He said it. This is an aspect of God that's been weakened in perception by the doctrines and manners of men and this aspect of God has been awakened by the conduct of the Israelites yeah. what they have done yeah. has brought awakened God in a state of anger yeah. okay so some of the, nothing I do can change how God thinks well here's yeah. these Israelites can say wait a minute yeah, right. what we did what we did brought this response, mm -hmm. caused it. Smite the lintel of the door that the post may shake. Now, he's saying this to some part of his heavenly host. You know, several times we read, read, read he's the God of hosts. So, so some of the hosts are there. Yeah. And so this is, a, this, is, this is not a word delivered to men. This is a word delivered to these yes, angelic hosts. Other versions read, strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake, or smash the tops of the pillars and shake the temple. Now, the, this was obviously a de destroying angel of some sort that received this word. Like the angel that passed through Egypt and slew all the firstborn, that was a destroying angel. Like the angel that during the pestilence killed 70,000 men from Dan to Beersheba yeah. in just a short time. 
or the angel that destroyed 185,000. Yeah. See, in God's, in God's army, there are destroying agents. Yes, amen. They're there. The lintel. What is a lintel? I got a picture of it. A lintel, by definition, is a architectural member spanning across uh, horizontally across a building that up on which the pillars are fixed that hold up the building. So this this lintel is what holds up. The structure, and there's a picture of it there. You see those pillars, yeah. the ornate tops, and that apparatus on the top, that's a lintel. Yeah. Like on our door, see the, there's, a, there's a lintel on top of this doorway here, see. Uh -huh. So this is the temple of the Lord he's yeah. talking about. Uh -huh. Smite the lintel. Then when you destroy that lintel and the pillars, they won't, they'll, right. they'll begin to wobble and the building will collapse. That's right. Because yeah, lo right. right. if you mess with that, you're messing with the building. That's right. <laughs> load bearing, that's yeah. right. The burden shall fall. Yeah. <laughs> so when this lintel was struck with angelic force, the entrance pillars connected to it and upon which the whole building was suspended would shake, jarring the building until it just yeah. collapsed. He says, cut them in the head, all of them. All right, he's not talking about people. That's right. He's talking about these pillars. Uh -huh. See the top there, the heads, they were the, or, they were the ornate mm. part of the pillar. Some of the other versions say, break them on the heads of them, that the, the pillars mm -hmm. of them all. So you, you struck the lintel, then you lopped off the heads of these pillars. Bring them down on the heads of the people so the people in the temple would die because the thing collapsed because he struck, he jarred, he jarred things loose by striking the lentil, then the pillar's not connected to it anymore. Then the pillars, he cuts off like with a mighty sword, he cuts off the top of the pillars, they just <laughs> fall down and collapse, the building falls. When the tops of the pillars are cut off, the whole structure would come down on those that were in the temple, which in this case be the Levites. Now, I, God did destroy the temple several times, actually. The temple was pillaged by Shishak, king of Egypt. It was pillaged by Jeho Jehoash, king of Israel. It was pillaged and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple was plundered by Antiochus Epiphanes, and the third temple built by Herod was destroyed in 70 AD by the Roman army, <coughs> fulfillment of the words of Jesus. So see, the temple, there's three temples. Three temples have been destroyed. The point of this all was that God will not allow the superstructure or outward form of his worship to be, to continue uninterrupted if it's profaned by the people, the superstructure itself will be brought down, which will create pandemonium. It will create division. It'll create variance and confusion because the temple itself has been brought down. Something to see, else to see here is that the heads of spiritual defection will not be able to survive the demise of their own creation. When the temple on which the false priests everyone relied, when it comes down, they come down too. Yeah. They, the people who defiled it can't stay alive if the temple that was defiled is brought down. Yeah. So whatever you're connected to, you share its destiny. Yes, that's right. If you're associated with eternal temple, you're eternal. Yeah. If you connect yourself with a temporal temple, you're temporal. Yeah, right. You share the destiny of what you're connected to. Yeah. Do you wonder why God says, come out of her, my people? Yeah. Do you wonder why he says that? 
you cannot be associated with what God's bringing down without yourself being brought down. Amen. That's right. And you can't associate yourself with what God's going to make stable without yourself being made stable. What you're connected with. Now the demise of the temple bringing an end to the structure is confirmed by the fact that since 70 AD there has not been one high priest in Israel. Since 70 AD there has not been a single high priest in Israel. This is confirmed by Jewish literature. Even though they still do, I read, track the DNA of everybody so they can restore it sometime. But there has been no high priest and the, even the office of priest has, by their own admission, uh -huh. been greatly diminished. The rabbi has taken the place of the <coughs> priest. If you, go to a, if you go to a local synagogue, you will not find a priest. Uh -huh. yeah. You'll find a rabbi. Yeah. Uh -huh. Or in some cases, a rabbi S. Uh -huh. What does that tell you? When he brought down the temple... Everything that depended on that yes, amen. temple yeah. was brought down to. Yeah. Amen. So this is a principle. If where the power was made known originally, where it was intended to be made known, if that is defiled, God will bring it down and the power will pass when the temple passes. All right, let's apply that. This may account for the rarity of miracles yeah, in our yeah, day. That's right, yeah. I know that I came from a background that said God quit doing that. Uh -huh. yeah. But they never told us why he quit yeah. doing that. Uh -huh. Well, they did say, they said the Bible was complete. When the Bible is complete, it quit. Hmm. But I'm more and more, I'm beginning to be of the persuasion that uh -huh. when the church became defiled yeah. and God judged it, the spigot to the miraculous was cut off. Yeah, that's right. yeah. And it's still, there still occur on occasions like it did with Gideon. Uh -huh. Doesn't mean that God doesn't do anything supernatural, but it is rare when he does. Yeah. And even the miracle workers know it's rare. Uh -huh. yeah. Even those that rely on miracles would admit maybe one time in their entire lifetime they saw one. Uh -huh. Why? You see this principle? Strike the lintel. Right. It shakes loose the pillars so they can't they can't stay. Uh -huh. Knock off the top of the pillars. They knock it off. The temple collapses, yeah. and all that went on in there yes. is yeah. destroyed. You got to have a good temple uh -huh. to have power. Amen. That's right. You have something going on. It is a genuine connection with God. And a genuine service of God, that's got to be in place before you get the power. Yeah. <coughs> that happened in Gideon's day, remember? Uh -huh. He said, uh, <coughs> where's the miracles? Yeah. Amen. See? Yeah. They've been, they've been John Lively shut off. And this was a, how come there's no more miracles? This is why. There had been a defection. Yes. There had been a departure. There'd be a destruction of temple yeah. worship. Uh -huh. This is what had happened. So there was an absence of the power. Asaph suggested the same thing. He 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 pointed. He yeah. wondered why there was such an absence of power. Uh -huh. And Mashiel of Ethan posed the same scenario in Psalm eighty nine. That they notice there been an absent, like a forsaking of God. What, what, what's happened? Why? Uh -huh. See, nobody's asking this question today. Uh -huh. At least, no one of any consequence. Uh -huh. This question isn't being asked today. So, why does it? Why don't these things happen uh -huh. like they did in the Book of Acts? Yeah. Some people ask that. Well, the boy Smoten and I have talked a lot about this. Uh -huh. Why is it absent? Mm. It's because the lentils yes. has been struck. Amen. And the top of the pillars have been yeah. cut off, and the house has fallen. Yeah. That's why. 
and I will slay the last of them with the sword. So I'm going to I'm going to wipe out the corruptors. That's probably referring to the priestly leaders of the people, those who those who were not destroyed when the temple came down. God had hunt them down, slay them with the sword of their enemies. Is the idea. Yet it remains a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. That's why the disciples, the apostles were so insistent that the church be holy and the yeah, church be amen. separate and that it not provoke God. Yes. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living yeah. God. They knew, they knew you can't be aggravating God and hope to survive. Yeah. If God's given you a lot and you've been giving him a little, you are in jeopardy. That's right. This is dangerous. We're not going to say, well, you know how we all are. We, oh, this is not sufficient at all. Yeah. God's been patient now. We're going to have to admit God's been patient yeah. with this situation. Yeah. This situation has been around for several decades. God's been patient. Mm -hmm. It's not because time, had, the sufficient time hasn't been allowed. Amen. He's going to show now that any attempt to escape this judgment, is, it's going to fail. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. He that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. <coughs> now, he's, he's showing the thoroughness of the judgment. No wisdom, no strategy, no methodology will enable them to avoid what's coming. It reminds me of the word that God spoke to Micah, to the remnant Of Jacob, who though few in number would triumph over their foes, of whom, uh, the, of whom the, it is said of the foes, and none can deliver. See, that was. <laughs> well, the psalmist solemnly warns, Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver. See? Even more sobering is this word to those who are in Christ Jesus. See that ye refuse not him mm -hmm. that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks yeah. from heaven. Amen. He yeah. tells us. Yeah. Uh, I've observed that the age of technology and technological advance mm -hmm. has brought a false sense of security yeah. to a lot of people. Uh -huh. Whatever difficulty... They may experience, there'll be some that will think that there's a way out of it somehow, mm -hmm. either by myself or someone else available to me. Further, some have adopted a view of a life in Christ that is in much the same manner. Mm -hmm. I shall not perish whatever I do. Yeah. God loves me too much mm -hmm. to let me perish. Yeah. These people, this is how some people reason now. Well, that's the very way Israel reasoned. This is just exactly the way they reasoned. And he says, no, no, you're not going to not gonna escape. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away. In other words, he, he may commence to flee, but he'll not yeah, right. accomplish it. Uh -huh. He may start to escape, but he'll not escape. Now, the time to escape is not when the wrath is being poured out. Yeah. That's not the time to escape. The time to escape, at the time the rats poured out, all the escape routes are closed. Yes, amen. He who can make an escape, God can also close off the ways of escape. Mm -hmm. The Lord can make it so no person can commence to run out of the trouble and actually succeed in doing so. He began to run like he's done before, but there won't be any door open doors. There won't be any way, any route to escape. He that escapes of them shall not be delivered. That's saying much the same thing, but it's from the viewpoint of the runner. He's not going to be able to facilitate his escape. As I said, the time of escape is not when the wrath is being poured out. I think that most of you here tonight 
know that something's coming in a form of a judgment. I'm not sure everybody is preparing for it. I hope this is the case, but I'm, I'm busy myself doing this. But if you're not, when the time comes, you won't be able to prepare. Yeah, amen. There'll be no place to get oil. Yeah. That's right. This is the way the kingdom of God works. Now this is illustrated in the Lord's reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. The time to escape was actually prior to the invasion. Mm -hmm. yes. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, yeah. then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Mm -hmm. It's close. Yeah. <laughs> then, yeah. Yeah. then, let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. Don't, don't anybody that's living out in some of those countries decide to move into Jerusalem at that time. Yeah. The time to escape yeah. is before. Uh -huh. Not there. So those who wait for the last minute, they won't escape. Yeah. Note that Jesus warns there will be some who think it's appropriate to enter into the city uh -huh. in the surrounding countries. He says, don't, don't move back in. May look safe. Just may look like the Roman soldiers just camped around about just kind of surveying the situation. No, they're going to destroy the city. Yeah. Get out of there. Amen. Same thing was true of Lot. He had to get out yeah. before the destruction yeah. commenced. Yeah. When the destruction commenced, it was too late. Then you couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. Oh, this message needs to be preached. Amen. Yeah, brother Gibbon, once If you look at the 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 wrath of God is like on top. And in between you and that wrath is like a lintel of mercy. Yeah. It's grace. It's a time of grace right now. Yeah. But once it's once it wrath breaks through, there's no more grace. That's right. No, no more. more mercy. No more able to repent. That's right. No more. No more. Just cry for rocks and mountains yeah. and they won't listen to you. When Lot lingered, remember he tried to, the angel were leading him out and he lingered. The angel took hold of him. Physically. I don't know if it's physically, but he took hold of him and said, Haste thou, hurry up, hurry up. Escape thither, that get over there. Get out of here and get over there. For I cannot do anything until thou come thither. That is said to you, come to that city over there. Some other versions say, flee but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That's Zohar. Mm -hmm. yeah. So not he couldn't. That's that not the the destruction couldn't commence not just because a lot left. Uh -huh. Lot had to be at his destination yeah, that's right. yeah. before the city would be yeah. destroyed. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, Judah. God isn't hunting for reasons to condemn either. Mm -hmm. That makes the being in the place of His wrath even more. Um, Unforgivable because there is a time that you can get out of it. Uh -huh. yeah. You've got to get while the getting's good because there is a time that you can flee from it. Mm. Yeah. If uh, some of us are right, and in general, I think we are. How, how specifically? How specific we could be? I'm not sure. That the destruction of false religion is nigh at hand. If that. Mm. If that assessment is true, mm -hmm. this is the time yes. to get out. Amen. That's right. uh, it may mean the loss of a career. It may mean the loss of friends. It may mean a lot. Get out. Yeah. Because once the, once the destruction comes, nobody is going to be salvaged that's in there. Amen. Now, John told me, he says, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her plagues. That's what he said. Now notice that uh, the word of God speaks in this manner. See, we fled. In other words, when we come out, we're fleeing mm -hmm. from one environment to another. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. We have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. Now notice there's two objectives. One's get out, 
we fled away from. But second is to lay hold on the hope <laughs> set before us. Now, both of these are indispensable for survival. You've got to get to Jesus like Lot got to Zoar. And you've got to get to Jesus to have the hope of survival like Lot had to get to Zoar to have the hope of being preserved. I can't, I can't stress these things too much. If anything, I feel uh, almost inadequate uh, to what's necessary. I want to be better at this to prevail upon men, to escape to rivet it in their conscience. I gotta get out of here. Yes, amen. Hey. We're living in a time when men have been tranquilized mm -hmm. yes. with lukewarmness and casualness. Yes. We can see in this account of Lot that the danger of thinking you're in safety before you really are, too, with Lot's wife. Oh, yes, there you are. Uh -huh. Amen. In fact, she wasn't safe yet, but that's she, right. she was. She was out, but she wasn't in. Yeah, that's Amen. right. Amen. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. The virus of lukewarmness and indecision has been placed into the life stream of the professed church. There's too little commitment. There's too little devotion to God. Mm -hmm. There's too little spiritual appetite. Yeah. There's too little separation. Mm -hmm. I'm ashamed of the church of our day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I regret that I ever was a part of it. Amen. See, are you concerned? Yes, I'm concerned about it, but the time's drawing near where it's, yeah. I'm beginning to see this is, this is not the time to buy oil. Is it, this is the time. Get your tanks filled. Yeah, right. Have your vessels filled. Yes. We don't know when the time will, will come. Too many people have uh, settled for the baubles, cheap baubles of distraction, fleeting joy, and pleasures for a season. They've settled for that kind of life. Yeah. Just to have fun. Yeah. Have enjoyment. Be happy. They've settled for that, with too little spiritual appetite, too little faith, too little discontent with the world. See, the wrath of the Lamb is coming. Yeah, amen. When it comes, there's going to be some cry out for the rocks and mountains to hide him from the wrath of the Lamb, but the rocks and mountains won't hide him. Now's the time to hide. God's established a man for a hiding place. Amen. Amen. Just like Isaiah said, Isaiah 32. God's established a man for a hiding place from the storm, from the heat of the day, from the winds of trial. Now is the time to get into Christ, yeah. get out of the world. Amen. And if you do, when the angel strikes the lintel mm. and lops off the head of the pillars, It'll not touch you. Yes, amen. They'll fall on the right hand and fall on the left, but the plague will not touch yeah. you. Amen. There's safety in Christ Jesus. So flee now. Flee now. Flee now. Yeah. Do it now. Right. Those who do not obtain consolation before Jesus comes mm -hmm. will never obtain it. Yeah, that's right. Those who wait for Babylon to fall, to fall and don't exit it, They'll be partaker of her plagues. I, I don't know to what extent. I, yeah. I don't want to be in that position. Amen. Amen. Whatever God's going to curse, I don't want to handcuff myself to something That's like right. that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's an unequal yoke. Yeah. An unequal yoke is you're yoked up with someone's going to be destroyed. Mm. Don't yoke up with them. Yeah. That's right. Say, what if I'm yoked now? Break it. Somehow break it. Break it. Or ask God to do something about yes, it. Right. Maybe, maybe something can be done about it. You may, who oh, no, knows, so wife, you may, hey, save your husband. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's possible. <coughs> I'm 
God will have to do it <coughs> through your separation. Yes, that's right. All right, any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Brother Jason. It seems to me that the, the flesh and, and the world uh, seems to militate against believing that God's judgment will ever really fall. That's true. That's the, true. The tendency, is, the tendency is to say, well, everything is just going to go on forever like it always has. Yeah. Like, like Peter said, some, some mock the coming of the, of the Lord said, ah, everything's just going to go on like it always has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the way that the flesh is and the world kind of convinces people that nothing will ever change. Mm -hmm. This, that kind of stuff is not going to happen, at least not in our day. Maybe, maybe, okay. it'll, happen, maybe it'll happen sometime in the future. Mm. And so there's a there's a tendency to, to feel to feel a false peace or a, yeah. a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you have to you have to fight that. You have to fight that yes, tendency amen. in the flesh and in the world. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you you you'd never run for to Christ for for shelter. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. And it, it emphasizes that the shelter is a man. It's not a group of men. That's right. it's, amen. Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah, in the judgment of the temple, I, I thought about the, what Jesus got upset about at least two times about the temple when he was in Jerusalem. Yeah. Once. The, the condition of the temple actually reflected the condition of the people. The people, amen. Mm -hmm. So you had corrupt people before you had a corrupted temple. Amen. Mm -hmm. And one evidence the other. And that's the way it is uh, with with the church, in a in a, sha in, a in a sense, in that you know you have things in the church that uh, that provoke God because those those things were in the people first. Mm -hmm. They got yeah. they got brought brought yeah. into the church, mm -hmm. and so when God judged the temple here, the temple stood as like a uh, like a a monument or a representation of the nation Amen. Of, of the Jews. And so when God judged the temple, He was judging the nation, Amen. and that's uh -huh. what He's that's what He's going to do in in Babylon too. Amen. Yeah. And I think there's a personal application of, of that too, that principle, uh, with the in with the inward man or the or the heart and, and the body. Mm -hmm. Once the body is employed in some ungodliness or some unrighteousness, yeah. uh -huh. it it that's evidence of that ungodliness that was inside yeah, that's right. inside first, but uh -huh. it works both ways, where John, the apostle, reasons that if, if a man does righteousness, uh -huh. it's because he is righteous. He, is right. he has right. the same principle there on a, on a personal level. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Anyone else tonight? One other thought. Yes, one other thought that God has done done this before, where He has removed something that seemed to men to be immovable. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have examples of this. There were there was a time when there were kingdoms, yeah. like worldwide empires, that looked like they were gonna last forever. They called Rome the Eternal, Eternal City. city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The the idea that the Roman Empire could fall was inconceivable to the ancient yeah. world. That's yeah, right. but it fell. It fell. Yeah. To the Jews, what like Brother Aaron was saying, to the Jews, the idea that God would destroy the temple there. Remember, the, remember, the disciples were showing Jesus the stone. They said, "Look yeah. at these stones, yeah. Lord." Lord said, "I tell you the truth, there's going to come a day when not one of these stones is yeah. going to be left on the other." Yeah. And it was such a shocking thing to them; they immediately began to think of the end of the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Because to them, it was like the end of the Amen. world. Amen. Yeah. So God does that. He He can remove things yeah. that seem to men to be immovable. Amen. He's done yeah. it before to prove His point. Amen. Uh -huh. On an individual yeah. basis, all of you have probably experienced this. You probably experienced the destruction of something that you thought you could never get rid of. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Amen. Right? You've experienced it on a personal yes. level. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It talks about um, knowledge being increased. You went over a little bit of this in your lesson there. That this, um, you know, this when this higher criticism came along, and and yeah. we got so smart that we were able to actually trump the scriptures yes, to be sir. able to say, well, wait a minute, that isn't really what they meant when they said that. Yeah. But what does that do? Well, it neutralizes the That's truth. Right. It makes it to where it's of none effect, and you can have people that that are so wise in their own understanding. That they just can't find God. There's yeah. all kind of short statements that people make 
that plant the seeds of doubt. Yes, that's right. And they seem innocent. Like they'll say, well, the Bible really doesn't have chapters and verses. Mm -hmm. Sounds innocent enough. Yeah. But it does a damning work. Yes, it does. Uh -huh. Or this is what we call. Uh -huh. See? Mm -hmm. All of that casts a shadow, yeah. a question mark yeah. on the scriptures. It's, you doubt that the person who says it is doubting the scripture, that this, this is the kind of language Satan can use. Mm -hmm. Something was lost in the translation. Yes. Pretty soon you've people read the Bible with this in the back of their thinking, I'm not sure if this is right or not. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So who's going to devote themselves to something they're not sure whether it's right or not? Yeah. Nobody. That's right. They won't do it. So this has happened over long uh -huh. over a long period of time. Yeah. Anyone else tonight? All right, let's have a word of prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the stability of Your Word. We thank You for the invincibility of faith. We thank You that You have made a way of escape. We thank You for giving us grace to make our way through it. In Jesus' name, amen.